Greetings in that strong and blessed name of Jesus. Welcome to Fully Alive. Fully Alive is an outreach ministry of the Church of God of Cleveland, located at 11100 Union Avenue, Cleveland, Ohio. Well, praise our God. My name is Pastor Abe Jeter. We're studying the Gospel of Luke. We're on chapter 10. And Luke has been a very exciting study for us. Amen? And so, uh, we want to open in a word of prayer today. In the name of Jesus, we do come boldly before the very throne of your grace. And Almighty God, lift me out of myself. I pray that I can be a vessel, a voice that you will use in Jesus' strong name to speak into the hearts and minds of your people. In Jesus' strong name, the people of God said, Amen. Well, amen. In Luke chapter 10, amen, uh, hopefully we'll get, get down to verse 20. We'll see. Uh, Jesus, uh, my caption says, Jesus sends out the 72. And yet when we read the scripture, it talks in terms of 70, you know, and so, amen, there's some controversy there. But nevertheless, uh, we notice in chapter Nine, Jesus had sent out the 12, amen? And uh, with similar instructions, okay? Um, and there were signs following because they preached the gospel everywhere and they healed the sick. Well, praise our God. And now we find Jesus sending out an additional 70 in towns and cities where he was to come. Luke chapter 10, verse 1, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place where the he himself would come. Verse 2, Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his vineyard. Now in my mind, I'm picking up from another gospel which says the, uh, the harvest is plenty. Actually, what he says here is that the harvest is great. And that seemed to be even more than plenty. It's great. The harvest is great. We're going to pick up on that in a minute. But let's, uh, let's look at the pattern, first of all. The pattern of Jesus was to send a team into an area beforehand. Amen. And his pattern was to go two by two. Amen. Um, we notice uh, when we had dealings with the uh, the late great uh, Billy Graham and his crusades, um, they seemed to have followed that pattern. They would send in a team. I don't know, maybe a year ahead of time, but definitely ahead of time. And this team would work with people. Uh, they would get people prepared uh, to receive. Uh, the evangelist, and the word that he was bringing forth. They would organize prayer groups. Amen? Amen. They would uh, organize uh, Christian life and witnesses classes so people get in the word of God every week. Amen? And they would organize uh, and train teams who would actually do the witnessing uh, at the crusade. Amen? Uh, to know how to lead people to Christ, know how to answer questions. Amen. Praise God. Uh, and, and so what would happen is that these people, minds and spirits and hearts would become renewed. That's way before uh, the crusade. Amen. People uh, would get saved even in as they role played in the Christian life and witness classes. Amen. It was something, something. Praise God. What a uh, a, a pattern. So they, they followed Jesus' pattern. 
amen, to send a team in uh, to that area where they were going to go. All right. Well, praise God for that. Amen. And so, amen. And, and so, but that same pattern, uh, God the Father used because uh, even God himself sent John the Baptist to prepare the way before Jesus. Amen. God is about effectiveness. Now, I know somebody says, well, it's God and you know, and all he need to go and, and bring folks. Listen, God is very practical and he's about effectiveness. And there's some things he wants us to do first. Amen. So we need to think about that. Amen. And so in the Graham crusade, they went in first, got people praying. Amen. They should have been praying all the time, but he began to put a great emphasis on it. Got folks praying. Got folks in the word again through the life and witness class. Amen. Folks were renewed. Amen. Folks got saved. Folks got fired up. It was the revival before the revival. Well, and then it was revival after the revival because of that foundation that was laid. Well, praise our God. Amen. And so he says, the harvest is great. Laborers are few. The harvest is great. The laborers are few. And that was back there. And you remember uh, when he had sent to the disciples in town at, when he was at uh, uh, Samaria and, uh, and they got back, he told them to lift up your eyes, he says, because the fields are white for harvest right now. And how much more so now? And yet, and yet this admonition here, the harvest is great, the laborers are few. It is so hard for us, it seems, to get a hold of that. It is so hard for us to get God's heart when it comes down to winning souls. Uh, clearly, it's an area that the enemy is working overtime to keep us from getting excited about the things of God. It's like when the angels of God from heaven went to Sodom and Gomorrah to save Lot and his family. Lot could not get excited about the danger. Uh, the angel says, God has sent us here to destroy the city, but we can't do anything till we get you out. He could not get excited. He could not sense the urgency. And the angels had to take him by the hand. And even then, his wife looked back, and the judgment of God was on her. Almighty God, help us, help me, Lord. Cause this admonition to become a lie in me. You said, Lord, the harvest is great. The laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of harvest that he would send forth laborers. Almighty God, cause me, my God, put that urgency in my heart. Awaken me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. I acknowledge, Lord, that there's a great need here. He said the answer was prayer, to pray. Amen. Help me to pray. But not only just to pray, help me to pray and fast, Lord. And not only just to pray and fast, but help me to pray uh, and, and, and fast for your heart, Lord. And to, uh, not only to pray and fast for your heart, almighty God, but help me to fast and pray with a willingness, with a willing heart to be that laborer. I heard a story about a woman I believe she had six daughters. She had this heart and passion for missions. And she had those girls every night praying for missionaries. Guess what? When those girls grew up, guess what they came, became? Missionaries. <laughs> and God has a way of doing that. Because as you begin to pray that God would raise up laborers, he's going to raise you up. Well, praise God. That's what we need, Lord. That's what I need. Listen. Praise God. And so, 
Yes. And, and so uh, he sent him out two by two. Praise God. And his focus, his heart uh, were winning souls. And that's what he was concerned about. And his motivation was because the harvest was plenty. That, that was the urgency. Uh, Jesus sent out 12. But there was an urgency in his heart to send out an additional 70. What was the urgency? What was the motivation? The harvest was great. Someone says the fruit is dying on the vine. Oh, God, help me break this complacency in my heart. Break this hardness, Lord. Break this lethargy in the name of Jesus. Verse 3, Jesus says, go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. What? He was sending them to Jewish people. He was sending them to the people of God. And yet, he says, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. He was saying that evangelism is dangerous business. Wolves kill lambs. Wolves eat lambs. Evangelism, dangerous business. Come on, you know they wanted to kill Jesus. It was the religious folks that got so upset with Jesus they wouldn't kill him because he was telling the truth. And he was telling these disciples, as you go forth and share truth with people, as you go forth in evangelism, I'm sending you forth as lambs among wolves. There's going to be some folks who want to kill you. There's going to be some folks who want to eat you up. There's going to be some folks who want to eat you alive. Listen, what was he talking about when he says, I, I'm sending you forth as lambs among wolves? Jesus was talking about the nature of fallen men, the natures of fallen men. And the demon spirits that control lost and evil men. Scripture had in many places referred to the character or it uses animals to refer to the characters or the nature of fallen men. In Luke 13, 32, Jesus said of Herod, Go tell that fox, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I, I shall be perfected. But he, he said, go tell that fox the nature of his character, his fallen condition. Listen, uh, in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul described the false teachers that were going to rise up and draw men and women after themselves, he, he described them as grievous wolves. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul, as he described the Judaizers who was following behind him, stumbling the Philippians and others, he said, beware of dogs. In Matthew 23, 33, Jesus called the Pharisees, ye serpents, vipers. <laughs> uh, John the Baptist says, you vipers, 
who have won you the flee from the wrath to come. <laughs> and so uh, many times in scripture, God uses uh, the character of animals to describe the character of fallen man and the spirits that work in and through them. However, we believe that the salvation experience or the kingdom experience will bring about a radical transformation, a change of natures. Amen? Oh, yeah. Because uh, Paul says, like, and some of them uh, uh, were you, and, and, and some of them were you, you know? And you, you, you did these kind of things. But listen, but listen. Amen? But now Jesus can say to believers, be harmless as doves. <laughs> well, listen. What, what, what happened? There was a radical change of natures in Christ, okay? Uh, Jesus tell believers to be harmless as up. In, in Isaiah 11, and a lot of people uh, 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 are looking for some future experience out in the future, but we believe that Isaiah 11 is fulfilled in, 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 in a kingdom experience. Uh, uh, it's fulfilled. Amen. We believe that the transforming power of God in Christ in this present kingdom of God experience transforms those lion and 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 wolf bear like natures uh, into lambs in Christ and a little child is able to lead them I, I'm going to repeat that we believe that the transforming power of God in Christ in this present kingdom of God experience transform those lion, wolf, bear-like natures uh, into lambs in Christ Jesus, and a little child is able to lead them. Well, praise God. But that's not our subject today, amen? So I, I can't unfold this to challenge your, your thinking or your teaching, okay? All right, well, praise our God. Listen, amen. But Jesus was saying, saying to these uh, 70 as he sent him out that evangelism can be dangerous so don't do it without the holy ghost praise god that's why he had the, the disciples after he was uh, uh resurrected to tarry in uh jerusalem till pentecost said the holy ghost come until the holy ghost empowered them to do the work amen now you can't separate the holy ghost from the kingdom because Jesus says, I cast out demons by the Holy Ghost in the kingdom of God is coming to you. So, well, I send this kingdom of God dispensation experience. Amen. There's a radical transformation that takes place in Christ. But anyway, well, praise God. So in verse 4, he says, carry not, carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes. Salute no man by the way. He's giving them instruction. Amen. Praise our God. Uh, emphasizing to them they need total dependence on him. Amen. Uh, he was developing and training them to walk by faith with total dependence on God. Here he's going to show them that he wanted them to have a, a clear focus, not get distracted. Verse 4 says, carry neither purse, nor script, nor shoes. Salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. And into whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things that they set before you. And heal the sick that are therein. And say unto them, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But unto whatsoever city you enter and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same and say, even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be sure of this, the kingdom of God hath come nigh unto you. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom 
than for that city. And again, <laughs> yeah, amen. So he says, verse 12, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable, tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Wow. Okay. Praise. I got, now what I want to do is I want to go up, back up here and, uh, I want to, I want you to notice the how-tos, okay? But he gave some, some instruction, the how-to. And I want you to get this because notice, uh, he says the first thing you do in verse 5, when you come into a person's home, now, because what, what we think is once they open the door to us, we want to start preaching to them. No, that's not what you do. No, he says, the first thing you do is you bless the house. You bless the people. You say, peace be unto you. Peace be on this house. So you bless the house. You bless the people. Praise God. Amen. And then, and then the next thing you do, verse 7, is you fellowship with them. Verse 7, and in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give. For the labor is worthy of his hire, go not from house to house. And so you're fellowshipping with them. You're talking to them. You're building bridges. You know, you're giving them time to drop their guards. Amen. You're building bridges. Amen. You're listening and you will determine what their felt needs are. Amen. We know what their real needs are. Their real needs is Jesus Christ. Their real needs are uh, uh, the kingdom of God. Amen. That, this kingdom experience. Amen. But the things that's important to them or uh, it would be their felt needs, okay? And so as you listen, you, you find out what those felt needs are because you need to address them because they're going to be the bridges to <clears throat> teaching them kingdom, the kingdom of God, okay? Well, praise our God. So, so, uh, amen. And so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, fellowship with them. Give them time to relax, to receive ministry from the man of God. Okay. And then three, now, now is, is, is actual time for ministry to take place. Okay. Praise our God. Listen. Okay. So, cause one actually learn about the areas of felt needs as you listen. Okay. And, and because in verse nine, he says, and heal the sick that are therein and say unto them, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Okay. And so now it's time to heal the sick, minister to their felt needs, and begin to talk to them about the kingdom of God. All right. Praise God. Listen, uh, divine healing is a felt need. Amen. Salvation is the real need. I repeat, divine healing is a felt need. A relationship with the living God through his son, Jesus Christ, is the real need. Okay. Praise God. But yes, minister to their felt needs because this is a bridge to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Amen. Notice the Bible says in Luke uh, 10, 9, heal the sick. No, he did not say pray for the sick. 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 He said heal the sick. Now listen, folks, I'm right where you are. <laughs> We're learning together. But he didn't say pray for the sick. Now we see a lot of praying for the sick. But what we don't see is healing the sick. What we need to see is healing the sick. He said heal the sick. The Bible says they went everywhere preaching the gospel and healing the sick. Father, help us to go everywhere preaching the gospel and healing the sick. <laughs> Amen. Well, praise our God. Amen. So, verse 10. But into whatsoever city you enter and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same and say, even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, 
we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom and for that city. Wow, what an amazing statement. Listen, I want to say that there's a, an awful danger of sinning against light. The awful danger of sinning against light. Now listen, he goes on his, and began to pronounce some woes, okay? He says, woe unto thee, verse 13, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at judgment than for you. Think about that. Verse 15, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shall be cast down to, thrust down to hell. For he that heareth, and he goes on and says, he that heareth, you heareth me. And he that despises you despises me. And he that despises me despises him that sent me. And this is what you There is an awful danger of sinning against light. Listen, listen. Capernaum was Jesus' headquarters. Uh, uh, mighty miracles were done in Capernaum. Capernaum. Listen. He says, thou Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven, thou shall be thrust down to hell. Listen, there's an awful danger of sinning against light. Amen. Uh, uh, God sent the angels to Sodom and Gomorrah and told Lot that he needed to run for his life. He told him and his family not to look back. But Lot's wife looked back and she was instantly turned into a pillar of salt. The judgment of God came down hard on her. There's an awful danger of sinning against light, okay? And I'm talking to somebody. I'm talking to you, pastor, you, you preacher who backslid. I'm talking to you, Sunday school teacher who's backslid. I'm talking to you, person who was raised in the church of God, anointed preachers and teachers. You said in the truth, but right now you backslid. I am talking to you right now. There's an awful danger of sinning against life. Listen, it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you at judgment. I say backslider, it's going to be more tolerable for, for, for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you at judgment. I'm saying that God is speaking to somebody right now, and I'm saying you need to run for your life. Uh, Angel told a lot, run for your life. And God is speaking to somebody who needs to run for their life right now. I say you backslider. I'm praying for you right now that God would break the power of backsliding off your mind, off your heart. That God would grant you repentance and, and save and faith. That God would give you the grace for absolute surrender before the throne of God. There's an awful danger of sinning against light. There's an awful danger of sinning against light. Uh, I said, backslider, I am praying for you. Tonight is your wake-up call. May God give you the grace of full surrender. There's an awful danger. Almighty God, that person that you're speaking to, give him grace to repent. Give him grace, O oh God, to make absolute surrender right now. In the name of Jesus, I break the power of darkness off that backslider's mind. I break the power of darkness off that person's mind who's struggling. I break that demon power in Jesus' name. There's an awful danger in sinning against light in Jesus' name. The Lord bless you. The Lord smile on you. Shed his countenance upon you. The Lord give you peace.